Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and for watching from home as well. Tonight, I, we've got a lot to, uh, lot, of, lot to talk about tonight. We've got, we've got uh, asteroids and planets and occultations and a comet and uh, some space mission updates. There's a lot of space to cover, so uh, let's get started. February gives us a very generous night window. It's as, as, as great as uh, 11 hours uh, at the beginning as of tomorrow night, and it's still a healthy nine and three quarter hours by the 26th of February. And, and that, those are the durations of night, and night is defined as the sun being 18 or, degrees or more below the horizon. But you don't really have to wait till night uh, to do your observing. In fact, some observing is best done before night. Uh, the, uh, trying to decipher the phase of Venus, for example, is best done when you've got some uh, little bit of light in the sky still so that the contrast with Venus is not that severe. And you can more easily identify the shape of the phase of Venus. Once the sun goes uh, deeper and it, the sky gets much darker, then the contrast is so great, Venus is just a blaze and it's hard to, uh, to see its phase. The same would be true for uh, Mercury. Also, twilight is the best time for those of us learning the sky or trying to teach others the constellations of the sky because in twilight, when only the brighter stars are visible, the ones that we use to connect the dots to make the constellation shapes, well, those are the ones you'll be able to see and easily recognize the constellations before it gets much darker and all the smaller stars come out to fill the sky. Speaking of constellations, here's what the sky is gonna look like tomorrow night. Uh, we've got the fall time constellations like Pegasus starting to drift off into the west. There we see Cygnus the Swan finally diving below the horizon. And it's from that point on, right across the sky, going right across the center of the sky, is the Orion Spur of the Milky Way. It's the next uh, arm away from, uh, looking away from the nucleus, we're looking out. <clears throat> and the Milky Way goes right across the sky, in fact it crosses the zenith, so it's well positioned for observing. And it's called the Orion Spur, which gives name to the Orion constellation. And of course, this is the time, best time of year to enjoy the winter constellations like Orion and Taurus, Riga, Perseus. They're all front and center, all ready for you to observe uh, to your heart's content. Of course, uh, in, the, in the east, we, be, we are starting to see the springtime constellation sneaking into view. In fact, here's the view at the end of this period on the 26th, and look how high Leo is at eight o'clock in the evening. So by, by uh, this time next month, you can just as easily observe and take time studying the springtime constellations as well as uh, the winters are still here. So it's like the god Janus uh, looking in both directions. You can. You can enjoy the wintertime constellations as well as, as springtime. And uh, turning our attention to the sun, uh, it, it climbs about uh, nine degrees over this reporting period. Can I click that to make it run again? There we are. And it's that rise in, in altitude that is squeezing our night window down by an hour. Uh, the, over the next 28 days. And it's interesting, this is something I, I picked up while working on this slideshow, is it's possible to have solar disturbances from two consecutive solar cycles occurring at the same time during the minimum that would ordinarily separate the two. And here we see, whoops, don't do that. Here we see active region uh, AR 2757 here. A few days ago, it was over here and it had a burst uh, of, of a little solar storm aimed our way with the particles arriving supposedly today. So I jumped online to see if there'd be any auroras and so on. No, there's no talk of auroras uh, from that. It's, and that's not to be, I mean, that's to be expected, I'm trying to say because when the sun is at solar minimum, uh, any activities like that, any kind of flares, they really don't pack much of a punch. Meanwhile, we have a new active region rotating into view, and it has been identified as belonging to solar cycle 25. So we've got, uh, basically, uh, cycle 24 hasn't quite finished its flip, yet at the same time, some of the lines have 
completed their flip and now are participating in solar cycle 25. Uh, this did produce a, a sunspot. It didn't last for long and uh, the officials at the NOAA were so unimpressed with this active region that they didn't even decide to give it a designation. And they have yet to announce the start of solar cycle 25 and they probably won't for quite a few months. Um, sometime this spring, maybe in April, it'll be declared, but right now we're still at minimum in between the two. Here we see the solar Parker, the Parker Solar Probe orbiting and taking advantage of, of uh, uh, Venus. Uh, every once in a while it has a chance to pass by Venus and transfer some of its orbital energy to Venus. It's getting a gravity, uh, what they call an, uh, a gravity assist, but it's actually a negative assist, if you will, losing some of its orbital energy so it can drop into a lower perihelion around the sun. In fact, it was earlier today, um, at 4.30 in the morning, our time, when the Parker probe did indeed pass on its fourth perihelion, the closest yet uh, to, to the sun. And uh, here we have some, whoops, here we go, here's some stats. Uh, this first perihelion that occurred, uh, the, the, it was at uh, 35.7 solar radii from the sun. But the one that happened today, earlier this morning, uh, this, it came within 26.7 solar radii. And the ultimate closest approach uh, uh, is planned to be at under 10 solar radii, so that shows you how much closer it will be by the time uh, it gets as close as planned. It's going to take 24 orbits in total, and the whole mission is going to last the, almost seven years in total. And after just two passes of perihelion, uh, the scientists, uh, mission scientists on this project have learned a lot about the sun already. And I'm going to show you a, a little clip here uh, of five things uh, that have already been learned uh, from the solar probe. Here are five features Parker saw. We've long known that space is full of cosmic dust. We can even see the dust from Earth because it reflects sunlight. Parker saw evidence that the dust stops at an estimated three and a half million miles from the sun. As the dust gets closer, the sun vaporizes it creating a dust-free zone surrounding the star. At Earth, it appears that the magnetic field lines flow evenly out from the sun, but Parker saw them behave in a surprising way. The magnetic field lines flip in a whip-like motion, turning 180 degrees around in a matter of seconds. These switchbacks came in clusters and were timed with fast-moving clumps of plasma in the solar wind. Scientists have long wondered if the solar wind is generated as a continuous flow or in spurts. We now see evidence that the solar wind has rough, irregular texture. The plasma within it also seems to lack an orderly sense of direction. Some clumps of solar material fire out into space, while others fall back toward the sun. These clumps may be distorting the magnetic field, causing the switchbacks. They may also be an indicator of what the solar wind looks like in its early stages after its birth on the sun. Parker found a transition point in the solar wind. The corona is the sun's faint, outermost layer that transitions to the solar wind. Before Parker, scientists knew that the corona rotates with the visible surface below it. But they didn't know how, or where, the solar wind switched to flowing straight by the time it reaches Earth. Parker has finally spotted signs of this transition, and the changeover happened significantly farther out than expected. Although the sun has been very quiet over the first two orbits, Parker observes several tiny bursts of solar energetic particles. While these events have been seen before, never ones this small. The fast moving particles from these modest bursts spread out as they move from the sun, making them undetectable from Earth. Without Parker's front row seat, we would never know that the sun is regularly producing these small scale events. Fast-moving particles are a source of dangerous radiation. The more we learn about these eruptions, the better we can protect our technology and astronauts. Parker still has more work to do, but it's already helping us see our star in a whole new light. Okay, let's jump to the moon, shall we? 
And uh, for the next couple of weeks, the sky is going to be getting lighter and lighter as the moon approaches first quarter this weekend and becomes full the following. So our best opportunity for doing deep space and astrophotography might be starting, whoops, <laughs> did it again. There we go. Uh, the 15th, it'll be uh, last quarter. So from that point on, the last two weeks of February should be ideal for doing your deep space work. Um, on the upcoming slides, I'll talk about the moon occulting some stars as well as Mars in a couple of weeks. As far as observing the moon, we don't have a chance at the lunar X and V this month because while the sun is at the right angle to produce those, the moon will still be below the horizon. By the time it rises, the angle won't be right anymore. So not this month. Um, as far as libration, the southern limb of the moon will tilt in our direction, fortunately during full moon. Fortunately, because that means that area of the moon will be illuminated and that'll give you an opportunity if you are interested in sketching or taking some photographs of these particular craters on the south limb that will be turned into our view best ever. And as far as apogee and perigee, uh, the full moon is February the 9th, or well, that, that would be universal time. And it, it um, approaches perigee on the 10th, almost at the same time. It, it just misses being a full moon by a day, but the next three full moons will be super. Uh, and then apogee is uh, on the 26th. The difference between the two in distances causes this visual difference in size. Uh, the perigee, the, the moon will appear about 27, I, I'm sorry, 12.7% larger than at apogee. And now, occultations. We've got, you know, it's been a while since we've had a, a, the moon occult a bright star. Well, here, a week from tonight, you get to see it occult two stars. First, at uh, Geminorum, which occurred at the beginning of this video, and that's around uh, 7.43 uh, uh, on, on a week from tonight. And then four and a half hours later, Mu Geminorum slips behind the moon. So it's a rare opportunity to actually see the moon occult to two bright stars on the same night. And of interest in particular is Eta Geminorum. Here we see the moon just about to approach it. And it's really a uh, binary or a multiple star system. The western component is a brilliant 3.28, quite bright. And the eastern component is uh, much dimmer at uh, only magnitude 6. But the interesting question is, when the moon gets there, will it first cover the western star and then the eastern star in a two-step occultation? Or will they both wink out together? I think that'll be very, very interesting to watch. And then on the 18th of March, the moon's going to cover up Mars. Now, it'll be daytime. Uh, in fact, around 7.25 in the morning, our time, when, the moon, uh, when, the, when Mars is up in the, in the daytime sky. But it will be bright. Uh, the moon will be bright enough, I think magnitude 1.5, something like that. Uh, you should be able to see it with a telescope, uh, even in the daytime. So what I would suggest you do is get out there around 6 o'clock in the morning, an hour before sunrise. If you have a motorized telescope, aim it at Mars and start tracking it. And then keep your eye at the eyepiece, and you should see the moon come over and come right over it around... Uh, around 7.25 our time here. Now, the further west you are, uh, I used the Ontario Science Centre for my uh, stats. So if you are uh, west of the Ontario Science Centre, like in Etobicoke, it'll occur earlier. Or if you're further west, like in Oshawa, it'll occur a little bit later. But you get the idea. You can definitely catch this one if we are fortunate enough to have clear skies. Now on to the planets. Um, Mercury is going to reach greatest eastern elongation on the uh, 10th of uh, February. And at that point, it'll be uh, 18 degrees from the sun. 
and under high magnification and uh, with a clear transparent sky, you might be able to see the Mercury perfectly half lit when it's at uh, greatest elongation, at which time it'll be about 10 to 12 degrees above the horizon in the dusk in February on the 10th. So that'll be a prime time to see if you can catch the phase of Mercury with your telescope at highest possible magnification. Try and do it before it gets really dark, like I said before, before the contrast becomes too strong. Venus is also east of the sun and will be a magnificent sight throughout the spring as it climbs ever higher. I believe it reaches its own eastern elongation on March 25th, about 55 nights from now. And as it's climbing, it's actually getting closer to us. And that's why on consecutive nights, it'll become brighter and brighter. Uh, for example, uh, here we have the 30th of January, magnitude four, negative 409, 15 arc seconds wide, almost three quarters illuminated. And then when we jump to the middle of February, it's gotten brighter to negative 416. And the size has grown from 15 to 17, even though the illumination has reduced. And then by the 26th of, uh, of February, it's, ah, it's as bright as negative 4.21 and gotten even bigger and it's 64% illuminated, almost half lit. That's the way we hope to be able to see it in the sky with strong magnification. These uh, captures from Starry Night Pro were timed for 5.30 in the afternoon when the sky is not totally dark. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do is get out there before it gets really dark. That might improve your odds at seeing the phase of, of Venus. Mars, it rises about three hours before the sun uh, throughout the month of February, and it's really too small to see any detail at all. Uh, we're going to have to wait quite a few months uh, before we get a little bit underneath Mars from the sun's perspective and get us a, a, a good look. Of course, oppositions in October, we're looking forward to that. Uh, but in the meantime, Mars is not all that exciting, except for maybe the occultation on the 18th. Um, Asteroids, uh, there are six asteroids that are going to uh, go through opposition in February. And of those six, here we see five of them, uh, all passing through a cancer. Uh, the green arrows identify the location and magnitude of those five asteroids when they are at opposition. The dates that you see here are uh, for the dates in February. They all end in 20 because that's 8 p.m. Are, are showing you. So if you want to track these uh, asteroids, here's a good chart for five of them uh, that are all in the same vicinity, uh, all climbing through cancer around the same time. So you have an opportunity to examine each of these, maybe do some drawings of, of, the, of the asteroid with neighboring stars and then draw it again a night or so later and you'll see which one has moved. A fun exercise. The sixth of these asteroids is uh, number 12, Victoria, and it's going to reach opposition, I believe, on the 16th of uh, February, and it's much further south, uh, down in Sextons. Jupiter, well, this uh, shows you th the uh, yellow line, uh, arrows are the movement of Earth and Jupiter uh, throughout the month of February. Jupiter rises just an hour and a half ahead of the sun at the beginning of this period. And by the end of uh, February, it's only about two and a half hours ahead of the sun. In fact, uh, it's only 10 degrees up at the end of astronomical twilight, uh, at the end, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of night. So it's really in the murk. Uh, it's not gonna give you a, a good view. And for that reason, I decided uh, against showing you all the moon f um, phenomena like the shadow transits and so on because it's just down too low to enjoy. We're going to have to wait till about May to get a good look at, uh, at uh, Jupiter. And Saturn is even further east than Jupiter, so it's even in a worse situation. So we're going to have to wait till the summertime to enjoy it. So in the meantime, I thought I'd show you this pretty picture of Saturn, how it will appear courtesy of Starry Night Pro. And this is how it will look this summer. And for the first time in two years, we're gonna be able to see the southern limb of Saturn. It had been hidden by the rings for the last two years, but now the ring plane is beginning to tilt 
towards us ever so slightly. So it's starting to get a little bit flatter and we're gonna see a little bit more of the southern end of, of Saturn. Uh, it's gonna be a great treat in the summer, so we'll just have to wait. Uranus and Neptune, well, you can still catch Uranus. It's about 55 degrees high in this, in this graphic uh, uh, on the seven, at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Whoops, here we go. And Neptune, further down, that's more of a challenge. It's about 15 degrees above the horizon. But with strong magnification, you should be able to pick out the tiny little blue circle of Uranus, no problem at all. A bit more of a challenge to see Neptune. Uh, but if you catch it on a clear night, and if you have a good low horizon to the west, uh, you just might be able to pick out its ever smaller tiny blue dot. Venus has just passed Neptune. I believe it was at, uh, at uh, conjunction about two days ago. And Venus is on the way up, while Uranus and Neptune ice giants are on the way down. All right, Comet Panstar C2017 T2. This is the path of Panstar uh, during this reporting period. It's taking a turn as it works its way from Perseus into Cassiopeia. And uh, apparently it's gotten as bright as 9.4. Uh, that was a report that was submitted to the um, Comet observation database. If you'd like to check that out, uh, here's the website for the Comet observation database. And there were three, uh, there, there was a person who submitted a report last night pegging it at 9.4. Uh, and here's how it's going to pass across our sky uh, throughout the spring, uh, the remainder of winter and throughout the spring. We've got ringside seats because the comet is circumpolar throughout this period, so it's up all night. And uh, it won't actually cross out in, outside that circle until I believe the end of May, or in, actually it's into June before it's no longer circumpolar. So we've got months to enjoy this uh, comet, and predictions suggest that by the time it reaches perihelion, which is around the 4th of May, it should be magnitude eight, which would put it well within the uh, reach of of any telescope, any pair of binoculars. And some optimistic reports suggest it could go as high as magnitude five. Uh, but as David Levy taught us, uh, comets are like cats. They both have tails and do precisely what they want. So we have to take magnitude estimates with a grain of comet dust. But won't it be great at star parties or with school kids or whatever it is you're doing out under the sky to actually have a comet to show them? It's been such a while, and I'm really looking forward to enjoying that and sharing it with so many people at star parties this spring. Should be a lot of fun, it's been a while. And here's a picture that Claudio Oriani took uh, of that comet back in uh, early, uh, I think, it, yes, uh, beginning in early January, January the 10th. And he used the Burke Gaffney Observatory in St. Mary's University, uh, where they have a plane wave CDK24 robotic telescope available for your use. And Claudio did that. He had an exposure that lasted two minutes, and this is what he got. And I anticipate that we're going to enjoy at least that good of view in our telescopes this spring. And as it gets closer to the sun, hopefully that tail will grow out really beautifully. Meteor showers, nope. Auroras, nope. But if you want, you can check these two websites out and keep an eye on things, uh, especially later this spring into the early summer when Solar Cycle 25 ought to be kicking in. And we might get a lot a lot of uh, activity to enjoy. Uh, Starlink, now here's your update for Starlink. Uh, back on January the 6th, uh, there was a launch. It was called the L2 launch, which is the third batch because they started with zero, okay? And each of those launches had 60 satellites inside. And uh, as well, oh. Oh dear, earlier today we had another launch. 
L3, that would be the fourth batch of 60 satellites to go up into space. So now there's 240 Starlinks going around the sky. And this is what it looks like in the uh, cargo compartment before they actually leave. Uh, there's 60 of them. And when they get pushed out, they don't actually have rockets to move away from. They just gradually drift apart because I believe they still have a bit of atmosphere at this altitude, which will cause the satellites to separate. And once they're far enough apart, ground control can then grab each one and fire them up into their proper orbits. One of the 60, in, this by the way is L0, but with the L, um, with the L2 launch, one of those 60 satellites had the paint job to darken it. And uh, from what I read, it's going to be a few more weeks before SpaceX tells us what they thought of that experiment. Hopefully it works. And another thing I learned is that if you don't propel these, these little satellites, if you leave them just to be, they will eventually orbital degrade in about five years and totally burn up in our atmosphere. Now, that might be fun to watch. <laughs> I chose the 2nd of February on um, Heavens Above and said, what do we have in the way of L2? And here's what we got. These are all of the satellites that will pass across our sky on the 2nd of February. Again, I took the Ontario Science Center as my location. So these are the ones that will pass over the Ontario Science Center on that night. A total of 57 Starlinks and four Falcons are listed in here. I guess those would be either boosters or side boosters or something. I don't know what they are. Um, and uh, the, these passes occur from uh, a little bit before 6 p.m. all the way down to 9.20, by which time the sun is 20 degrees below the horizon, so we're truly into nighttime. Or oh, Ron, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure. I don't know what the third column is. Good question. Um, but what we do notice is their altitudes. Uh, where this is the altitude, maximum altitude, and they range from 12 degrees up to 70 something, 77 degrees. So in other words, these aren't exactly hugging the horizon. Okay, and it, and that's just the second. I mean, I chose the second out of random, but the thing is, that's happening tonight as well and tomorrow night and for a few more nights until I think it's the 6th of February when they start become daytime passes. And then by the 12th of February, they become pre-dawn passes. Uh, and that's just the L2 batch. I'm not sure to what extent L0, 1, or 3 may also interfere with our sky, but uh, there are some satellites here, I think, that are designed for uh, Northern Canada communications. So we're gonna have these in our sky, at least for a while. Hopefully that paint job works in the future. There's more shuttle, I mean, there's more, more launches. These are not, that. this is just the start. I asked uh, Heavens Above to give me a graph of the path of the first in that list, and then I called up the graphs for the rem a few more and manually threw in onto this one the curves or lines that those other uh, passes will create. And after doing about 12 of them, I thought, that's enough. That gives us a good idea of what it might be like. I'd have to throw in about 40 more lines to do everything that was on that list. So it's going to be an interesting experience for us to, to come into terms with these things passing the sky. And apparently, they're quite bright, brighter than most satellites. Uh, how about the ISS, speaking of satellites? Uh, would you like to catch the satellite uh, passing in front of the sun, maybe watch it, maybe take a picture of it? or a video. Well, here's a path, a transit of the ISS in front of the sun, and the center line runs through the Durham region. In fact, you can see it up here in Midhurst, Barrie, and it works this way. It actually goes through the Glen Major Forest area, and I was trying to find a good access point where you could get off, and but there's limited access around there. It's not easy, but I did find a really good spot down here in Southern Whitby. Uh, it's right here. There's the center line passing right across the waterfront trail. Just east of Forbes Street, just south of the OPG General Warehouse, you've got plenty of parking. 
Looks like there's ample parking, so you won't have any trouble finding a spot to pull off. Uh, there's open field here where you can set up. I would suggest you bring a shovel in case you need to clear a, some, a square from snow. And this location is very close to the Thixon Road exit off the 401. So if you have to travel out to Durham to catch it, you'll have plenty of time because the transit is in 2.12 in the afternoon. So you've got plenty of time to get out there, clear the snow, set up, catch the transit, grab a bite, and then go home because you'll be going against the traffic. It's nice and easy, right? You'll be heading back to Toronto. So you might actually be able to catch that one, and wouldn't it be fun at a future meeting if somebody showed us a picture they got of, of, of the ISS? It's doable. And happy Valentine's. Uh, Valentine's is this month. So I thought I would grab a few deep space objects that have maybe a Valentine's kind of connotation to it. Uh, like the Heart Nebula. So let's start there. This is the Heart Nebula. And you may have already seen this picture before. Uh, we got a, uh, a bonus with this one because the mate, the Sol Nebula, is right next door. And uh, this is a uh, interesting picture that uh, Adrian Aberdeen uh, took and processed and put out on our forum special interest group on astronomy. So if you visit that site, you'll find the details of what Adrian did to produce the image. But as you can see, he pushed the blue quite a lot. That's because it's his favorite color. And But these two nebula actually glow predominantly in the red light of ionized hydrogen, that red color. And that's the way they would look in a typical photograph. And some have actually referred to the uh, Heart Nebula as the Running Man uh, or Running Dog Nebula, based on what components they're actually able to see in their telescope. So it goes by a number of different names. Uh, finding it is not too hard. It's just five degrees southeast of Seguin here. And there, that, can you see that shape? Can you see the heart shape there in the soul here? Uh, they're faintly visible in this graphic. And uh, so it's not a very big jump to find them. Just go to Seguin and then drift a little bit to the southeast, and you might pick them up. And you'll already be in this area if you're following pan stars, because that comet is going to slice right in between them uh, in late February, early March. You'll already be looking in this direction. Now, here's the next one in our list. It's Messier 50, the heart-shaped cluster. Can you see a heart shape in those stars there? Now, the difficulty here is that it's a photograph, so you've got a lot more stars, uh, the faint ones filling the field of view that you might not ordinarily see in a telescope. But I think I saw a few patterns that might be the heart. Uh, for example, there's one. Is that the heart? Or there's some other stars that could contribute. Maybe it's a bigger heart like that. But apparently, when you look at it through a telescope, uh, which stars give you that heart shape will be readily apparent. And it's a very interesting uh, cluster as well. And finding it is not so difficult. There's M50. It's in Monoceros, halfway between Alpha Monocerotis and Beta Monocerotis. And over here, we have the sword of... Uh, Orion, Orion's sword, and the reason I mention that is the distance from the sword to M50 is a little bit more than 20 degrees. Now, a fist held out at arm's length will cover 10 degrees of sky. So it should be possible to put two fists in between the, uh, the sword and M50. Let me try and demonstrate that here. So there's one fist, and there's your second fist, and that'll put you right close to M50. And if you're in that area, you can find bright stars on either side. That would be Alpha, Montserratus, and Beta. Draw a line between them. And M50 is right on that line. Just a little bit towards Beta from the center point. Just a little bit closer towards Beta. Now, this cluster was discovered by Charles Messier in 1772 while he was observing a comet in the neighborhood. This cluster uh, has about, it's about 3,000 light years away. It has about 500 members. 
totaling more than 285 solar masses. It's relatively young. Would you say 140 million years is relatively young? Well, let's just say it's 140 million years old and it has a magnitude of 5.9, uh, so it's the brightest in our Valentine list and easy for you to catch. Third on our list is the Rosette Nebula, Caldwell 49. And uh, <clears throat> it's seen in this image here by Jeff Booth. It's a large spherical H2 region, circular in appearance, and uh, it's located in Montecero's region of the Milky Way. And NGC 2244, called Well 50, is this open cluster embedded right in the middle of the nebula. In fact, it was formed from material taken out of the nebula, and now these stars are so hot and fierce and blowing such strong winds that they've blown a hole in the nebula, allowing us to see them. This nebula and cluster lie about 5,000 light years away from us. And, and the remaining gas that hasn't fallen into stars yet apparently has enough to create 10,000 solar masses. Uh, that's a lot of bonbon chocolat. Um, by the way, to encourage others to try their hand at taking this image, Jeff would like you to know that he imaged this nebula from his backyard in light polluted Oakville. So if he can do it, he's encouraging you to give it a try too. And to find the rosette, it's, it's relatively easy. We're gonna, we're gonna go from Betelgeuse to 13 Monocerotus and, and down. Let's just try that now. It's about nine and a half, I'm sorry, nine and a half degrees east of Betelgeuse. And then once you have your telescope on it, uh, just drift down a little bit, about two degrees, and then you will come upon that. In fact, you'll probably see that cluster first. Uh, now it is possible to see the Rosette Nebula as well as the cluster in your telescope, but what you're going to need are two things, very dark skies and a narrow band uh, nebula filter to dim down those stars while still allowing the light from the nebula to pass through. Speaking of that nebula, um, it's really a, a, an impressive nebula. It's very young at less than five million years old. Its brightest two members are fearsome O-class monsters. Remember, O is the hottest, most brilliant class of main sequence stars based on any, any jump cannons classification scheme. One of those two O stars is so bright, it's 400,000 times brighter than our sun and 50 times more massive. To give you an idea, Betelgeuse is, I think, 11 times, and Antares 12 times the mass of our sun. So when you're getting up into 50, you're talking very large. In fact, another one of those O stars is even nastier. It's 450,000 times brighter than our sun, 60 times its mass. And a star that's that massive doesn't live long. A 60 solar mass star will live for only three million years. And that puts an upper limit as to how old that cluster itself might be. So if you're looking for a supernova, if you're waiting for Betelgeuse to go, well, maybe one of these will go first. They're really massive stars. And in the foreground is 12 Montesorotus. It's not a cluster star, it's 500 light years from us, whereas this cluster in nebula is 5,000. So that's just a foreground star that you might notice. And last on our list, our final Valentine's treat is the merging pair of uh, galaxies, NGC 20, uh, 4038 and 4039, which together combine to give us what we call the antenna uh, galaxies. And that's because they're colliding and the gravitational tidal waves that it's producing is throwing out long streamers of stars and dust and gas and two long sweeping arcs that give it the appearance of insect antennae. Whereas the uh, spiral structures of the galaxies are now colliding and coming together to form the two lobed heart shape that we see here. And this coming together has triggered a tremendous amount of starburst 
you can see very many active H2 regions and a lot of brand new bright stars along the perimeter of these spirals, one-time spirals. And the immense light causing these blue reflection nebula around the lobes of the heart. And uh, that luminosity of all the starburst activity has risen these two lobes to around magnitude 11. And that brings it within visual observing reach in dark skies with an eight inch or larger telescope. And we can use these top two stars here on the north wall of Corvus to help us find the antenna galaxies. We've got El Gorab and uh, Gienna. And if you draw an arrow or draw a line from El Gorab to Gienna, all right, and then let's continue that line for the same distance for the same length, and that'll bring you to within half a degree of the antenna galaxy. So hopefully that'll be good enough to help you find it. Okay. I'd like to quickly talk about two variable stars, Algol and Betelgeuse. As far as Algol is concerned, there it is on the western leg of Perseus. And that star has been uh, vilified over the uh, years, the ancient cultures. They refer to it by names such as uh, the demon star. We still refer to it that way. The head of Medusa, or Satan's head, or the specter's head in various cultures. And why all this... Uh, vilification, why, why all this negative talk? Well, that's because the ancient astronomers, of course, well before telescopes, using their eyes alone, they were able to notice that Algol would drop in magnitude a lot, 75% actually, less than every three days or every three nights on that cycle. And you can actually watch it dim and down. But stars aren't supposed to do that. Stars are fixed. They're stable. They're permanent forever. But not that one. Not that guy. That one's an outlaw. That one's bucking the rules. That one is challenging sacred order. Hence the negative terms. But today we know why, and that's because of the fact that it's actually two stars orbiting each other. It's a triple star system, but the, these two happen to orbit each other on our line of sight. So when the dimmer star comes in front of the bright one, we have that significant drop in light, the ones that the ancients were able to see. Now, when Algol is at its brightest, it is equally as bright as Almac or Gamma Andromedae, very close by at a magnitude 2.1. But when Algol is in mid-eclipse and at its dimmest, it's as dim as 3.4, which is this, the same as Alpha Triangulum, the uh, far star at the far corner of the triangle. This scene is for the 28th of February, so I did borrow into the next period. But I bring this to your attention because on that date, by 10 o'clock that evening, Algol will be at minimum. Now, it takes four hours for the eclipse to take it from its brightest to its minimum. It'll stay there for two, and then another four hours to rebrighten. So if Algol is, being, is going to be at minimum at 10 in the evening, it will have already started. The eclipse will already be underway as the sky darkens that night. And here's a chart that shows you nearby stars and their magnitudes. So when Algol is at its brightest, at 2.1, it'll match Almac. When it's at its dimmest, it'll match Alpha Triangulae. And here we have star magnitudes in between those two. So as Algol is dimming, you have companion stars in the neighborhood to compare it to. Is it down to 2.81? Is it down further to 287? Maybe to 2.93? maybe 331, eventually it'll get down to 3.4. So you've got a chart here to, to, to help you do this. And if you ever wanted to get involved with an organization, let's say the American Association of Variable Star Observers and want to join one of their programs, chances are they'll ask you to cut your teeth with Algol as, as a uh, proof of concept and, and that you enjoy doing it and then move on. 
while you're in the neighborhood, Owl Mac is a beautiful double star. You know, so bring out your telescope and have a peek at it. It's well separated, easy to separate, and it will remind you, I guess, of Alberio with the two distinctive colors, very pretty. And as far as Betelgeuse is concerned, uh, here's a light curve going all the way back to 1980. And as you can see here, Algol had a long history of fluctuating between 0.2 and 1. So it's 0.2 down to 1, then up to 0.2, then back down to, you know, it keeps going up and down in that range. Until last October when it started to go down to uh, 0.1 and didn't stop, it continued to go down. All the way down to the most recent observation, 1.62. Will it stop and go back up, or is it just going to continue, continue to drop? And if you would like to see for yourself if it's continuing to drop, here's a star chart that you can use with the magnitudes showing for neighboring stars. Now, this shows the traditional 0.43 that Betelgeuse would, has been in the past. And here's the 1.62 for Bellatrix that apparently it's equal to right now. So if we get a good clear night and you look at these two stars, apparently these two will look the same, but don't stare at them. The best way to uh, and, uh, judge magnitude of two stars is to go back and forth between them quickly. If you stare at a star, its magnitude tends to, in your, in your mind, tends to go up. So don't stare, just go quickly back and forth. Now, if a Betelgeuse does continue to go down, the next stars that it might match in magnitude would be these two here in the belt at 168 and 171. So if you want to give it a try, uh, by all means, here you go. We've got a few more months before the sun takes over. We've got a few more months to enjoy uh, Orion. So here's an opportunity to see if it continues to dim. Here's some updates on uh, th these manned shuttles, or, or crewed shuttles, as they intend to be. First, uh, on the 19th of January, the SpaceX had a totally successful in-flight test of their abort system, uh, in which the Super Draco engines on the capsule ignite and rip it away from the ascent stage, from the ascent uh, launch vehicle. And then once it cuts off the engines and reaches uh, Apogee, it then jettisons its cargo compartment and opens out so the uh, parachutes are exposed. And then it did a soft landing in the ocean nine minutes after liftoff. It was a perfect test. Everything, they nailed it all. They nailed every step of it. And it was the final in-flight test needed before they start carrying astronauts. So they successful successfully completed those tests. And here are the first two astronauts uh, that have been selected to go up into uh, the um, Dragon 2 to go up to the space station. Uh, these gentlemen have already flown on the shuttle, uh, so they have experience. Bob Benken and uh, Commander Doug Hurley on the right. In fact, it was his nephew that generated or that designed this, this patch, which is kind of cool. Uh, speculation is they may go up in April. We haven't heard an announcement yet, but uh, some suggest that it could be as early as April that they go up there. And originally it was designed to be a 14-day uh, visit and go home, but NASA is now consider, considering extending it into a full uh, shuttle uh, transfer, like a, a four to six month stay. So this could become an actual a proper uh, crew, part of a standard crew rotation. Uh, we haven't heard the final word yet. And uh, the Boeing Starliner, it attempted to do its orbital test to go up and dock with the space station. And the liftoff on December 20th started off okay, but when the second stage separated from the first stage, one of the onboard clocks thought the mission was 11 hours old. Well, if we're 11 hours into the mission, we're well into orbit, aren't we? There's really no need to turn on the stage two engines, are there? So it didn't. Meanwhile, other onboard computers uh, noticed that the attitude, the orientation of the capsule wasn't right, so they started to burn the thrusters to maintain proper attitude 
not altitude, attitude. And because they were still in the atmosphere, it continued to move, so they had to continue to use the thrusters. And by the time ground control realized what was going on, by the time they finally got the stage two thrusters to take off and insert the capsule into orbit, they had consumed so much fuel that it was no longer safe to attempt a rendezvous with the space station. So they cut the mission short on the two days, uh, did a successful soft landing in the white sands of New Mexico, and it's yet to be determined if they can now take crew. Had this been successful, they were anticipating a crewed flight in the summer, but it's now uncertain as to whether or not that's going to happen. Uh, the, whoops, I'm trying to, well, there was a press conference in which uh, the NASA administrators said that they have yet to determine whether or not a second uh, um, orbital flight is going to be required, so we don't know yet. And, <laughs> now this is Boeing. Oh, did they? Okay. Well, it's egg in their face uh, because the Office of the Inspector General came out with a report um, in which he said that the average seat cost uh, on the Boeing Starliner would be $90 million compared to only $55 million for the uh, SpaceX Dragon 2. Uh, and that put Boeing on the defensive, of course. They uh, said that, well, maybe the calculations the Inspector General did weren't quite right. And then they justified the frequent times they've gone back to NASA asking for more money, uh, which SpaceX said, we didn't have to do that. But Boeing said, well, we needed to do that in order to improve our reliability and flexibility and blah, 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 blah. Basically, they had NASA on a barrel because NASA wants to have an option. They need two. And Boeing, I think, took advantage of that. And I'll finish my talk here with a close-up view of asteroid Bennu, where the Osi OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is currently in orbit and took these views uh, looking for a safe landing site, and this is the one they've chosen. Uh, this, is go this goes by the name of uh, Nightingale, and it's their primary target. Uh, currently, they're practicing maneuvers, you know, taking flybys, seeing how low they can get, and so on. They're just practicing swooping around it uh, in anticipation of eventually s uh, coming down for a touch-and-go sample grab in, in August. And then it will uh, hang out at the, com at the asteroid in, in March of 2021. Uh, It'll start its two-year journey back to Earth to, with this precious cargo. So that, I believe, is a wrap. Does anybody have uh, any questions? Thank you. Okay. Well, there we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnold. That was a fabulous presentation.